Thank you. We are ready to restart. It's about 2.30. And we'll go to the compartmentalization factor scorecard slot. <laughs> so, uh, see, we haven't quite moved there yet. Uh, we're on our way. There we go. Thank you. So our, 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 we can reference our compartments easily by the name of our segments. Our permissions are via the access control list. There are multiple permission factors on our access control list, plus the gate code. Our sharing is via virtual memory and can have multiple processes easier. Our transitions between compartments is by a subroutine call. And because we're having multiple processes referencing the same segment simultaneously, we have very high performance and movement between compartments is easy. Okay. Next slide. So my question is, and it's the one you should be asking me at this point. If voltage is so great, how come aren't we using it? How come are we not using it anymore? What's the reason? There's got to be some reason for it. Anything either over Zoom or in the classroom? Well, what was it displaced by? What was it displaced by? <coughs> and when? And when? All right. Uh, so I would say it was displaced by lots of other systems. And it was about 1995 when the decision was made by the owners that it was not going to be done anymore. Honeywell com basically completely started getting out of the computer business in 19, around 1990. It ran on Honeywell hardware? It ran on Honeywell hardware, correct. Uh, the, uh, as an example of how in advance it was, the standard integer was 36 bits. The double width integer was 30, 72 bits. And the quad link integer of 144 bits was natively supported in the hardware. I don't know any general purpose machine today that supports that good of an arithmetic. Yeah, it was special purpose. But no floating point? No floating point? Oh, yes, it had floating point. It not only had, had the, what would today we call the something similar to the IEEE binary floating point. It had 99 decimal digit floating points as well. Decimal point. Okay. Uh, yeah, any other features of hardware you'd like to ask about? Well, the, the original question, why don't we use them anymore? And knowing a little bit of the history as I do, I would say that uh, a certain a certain pair of somebody's wanted to do this cool interactive time sharing, but they wanted to do it on this cheap PDP one instead of a super expensive Honeywell mainframe. Oh, now the whole question of of how Unix came into being in the PDP one, yeah. So uh, Kiernan and Richie and the whole AT and T team had some differences of opinion with Gentel and the GE people on how it should be done. And eventually they decided to withdraw from the project. They were legally not allowed to do so. So they basically got shuttled off into a corner where they were given a PDP one that nobody wanted because it didn't have much features and they got to play with it for several years without being responsible for anything. That's how Unix came into being. Okay. But you know, Unix had its, had its place. It was very inexpensive compared to other things and therefore 
well, universities could afford to get one and, and learn on. Yeah. Not everybody can fly a 707, although I have in a 707 simulator. But pretty much anybody can learn to fly a, a, a Cessna 150. It's it's within our price range. That's yeah. The cost of it was a, a, a very important factor, and it had would have had to be re-implemented on a less expensive platform. And at that point in time, the companies that did it were doing the architecture, the design. They were they were designing the chips. They were building it. They were doing it all by themselves. And now it's been factored out to other sorts of places. So they had complete control of the security and integrity of it. And today we don't. Very good. Any other one? How about graphic interface? The Multics command line processor was compatible and interactive in background, more powerful and flexible than any command processor for I know of even today that didn't have a graphic interface. And building one of those would have been expensive and would have broken a lot of the multiple things. Uh, next thing is that it cost a lot of time to show that a multix was secure. And for having a system that you need 18 months or two to three years from the time you build it until the time you give it to the customers just doesn't go into the environment. Uh, it was highly reliable. There were at least two of everything. So you, you very expensive. On the other hand, you can take a running system and say, I want to test a new version of it. So I take off the CMP, put the things out, boot the new test it, and then add it right back in. Boy, <laughs> just can't have it. And we already talked about the full responsibility. So would you put those on? Oh, you just did. Very good. Uh, questions before we move on. Anything about Multics that you that you would like to add? This is Nothing at this time. Okay. So let's move on, go to the opposite end, something that I didn't have any uh, set of building myself, I'm just a user, and that's the idea of PC. Let's talk a little bit about non-compartmentalization. When the product machine at IBM decided to create an inexpensive personal computer, they did so with an instruction set architecture, the ID, A, I, Intel ID 8080X series, that had user supervisor as its only means of compartmentalization. They also hired a programming shop to create a small OS. That was okay because it was going to be isolated physically from everything, so it wouldn't matter. However, when those computers were create, connected, it created a security disaster. Yes, I'm talking about Microsoft's MS-DOS and all of its follow-on. Note that the compartmentalization that initially existed was excellent. It wasn't connected to anything else except by the hand-mounted five and three-quarter inch uh, diskettes to be used only by one person. Let's just take a look at the compartmentalization factors for a time. Uh, you can see that basically the PC's got nodes and everything, while the Multics has great things in everything in that case. Let's go to the next slide. Basically, the daddy. No, 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 and 
the performance is pretty low because even then, how fast it could run and what it could do is just wasn't there compared to the input. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I want to have, uh, say one more thing. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, back up one. There's two here. Uh, go forward. Okay, so this is one that basically is order of magnitude performances, like how you get between two compartments. The key thing I want to get from this slide is when you can get to by one compartment to another by just a few instructions or a subroutine call, you got good performance between compartments. When you have to do a process switch or go between computers or go between on a network, you got performance issues. And so now going to the next slide, performance by security. Scott, we've got this triangle here with uh, the, this triangle where we see performance and security, which is basically the, why we do compartments to be able to secure our data appropriately and the cost. And as the statement sometimes goes, I can give you two out of the three, but not all three. Engineering is the process of making trade-offs. And I will summarize by saying, Multics died because it had the security, it had the performance, but the cost it had compared to other systems was high. And the difference was getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And the only way we could have gotten performance was completely re-implementing the instruction set on new hardware. And that itself is possible. OK, ready to move on? We're going to have a break, it says, but we took our break early. So we'll skip the break. OK. So today I uh, uh, we want to talk about compartments today. All right, I didn't turn that over properly. That's my fault. Let's let's go to the next slide. And ask the question: Do we need compartments? You know. It's nice to talk about something from an academic point of view, but the question is, do we really need it? So I'm going to take two examples from the health industry. The first one being medical insurance. Let's say that a medical insurance company is expanding its business out of Minnesota into a new state, let's say Nebraska. And as part of that functionality, they need potential and actual customers of each kind of the group covered to know, is this procedure covered by my insurance? And if so, is it an in-network or out-network network? Different costs. Now, if the data which drives the answers to these questions is corrupted or hacked or modified incorrectly and thus gives people a wrong answer, how critical is it? Not too critical. Yeah, people won't like it if we tell them they have to pay $5,000 for a procedure because they went to the place where they could have gotten it for a couple hundred. But we can solve that afterwards by the insurance company saying, okay, you're only going to have to pay $200. We'll give you a different bill. Okay. And other than the cost of correcting and fixing the correcting the data, fixing the error, we have a fairly low liability cost. And so the fact that our 
health medical insurance application isn't compartmentalized, isn't a big thing. In, in uh, I mean, just for a comfort point, the fact that it's not compartmentalized would lead to issues like data leaking, which I don't want. Right? You have information about the patient, which needs to be. Yeah, but notice that this is only the insurance aspect that it says, am I covered? That's the only part I'm starting at today. Yeah, the fact of did it get covered and uh, uh, did you get appendicitis or did you get treated for cancer and all that stuff? Yes, that needs to be compartmentalized. I agree. But I'm, I'm simply, for purposes of illustration, simply talking about is it covered? Yes. Okay. I, I, because I want to contrast this to the next part the drug infusion part. That's treating the medical condition and to keeping the patient alive. A drug infusion pump has to be delivered a monitored amount of a drug on a timely basis. Too much or too little or none at all could kill the patient. Now, if the data which drives this answer is corrupted, hacked, or modified incorrectly, and somebody died, is this critical? I maintain that it is. You know, and I spent a good part of my industrial career in life critical systems where if something goes wrong, it's likely that somebody will die. And so I maintain that, for example, number one, where we're talking about am I covered by insurance? the lack of the compartmentalization is not a good thing. For example, number two, what architecture doesn't provide compartmentalization, especially if the device has been connected to an open network by an inappropriate protocol. And you saw how at detector electronics, we effectively did a very specialized protocol to provide what we felt was the compartmentalization that was needed to make it happen. To an open network, yes, we're going to be in trouble. Okay. So uh, let's move to on to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about here something that happened fairly recently. The solar winds break in, with, in which the, uh, among other things, the uh, ability to deliver oil through pipelines on our whole East Coast got compromised. So I want to talk about some of the things that happened. <laughs> First of all, their first break into an account occurred with an account that was a, a, a single authentication factor. So that's the first compartment they broke into. And how did they get the uh, password to that account? Well, would you believe that the account which they used to, to, uh, to get into the configuration control management was actually in a piece of software which was in configuration control, which was available on a public network. So once they discovered that, they had the password needed to break in. So then they effectively got into the configuration control management. Okay. And what they there, what they did is that they put in a change to the system. And they waited to see if anybody was going to discover it. And nobody discovered it. So they put in a, 
bigger change and nobody discovered it. So they reverted those two changes on the configuration control, they took them out, and they put in a third change. And the third change was a binary compiled subroutine in a library. They put in a new version of a binary subroutine. Okay. That couldn't easily be diffed against what was there before to see what the change was and change was. And the company that, that built this did not do a proper review of the change notes versus the CI's change to say, hey, are we only putting into our new build? Those CIs which the chain approved changes say should go in. And so they stuck their binary library into the Solar Winds network installation program. This was then brought elsewhere. And the fact that this network installation was used as an installer without any controls over it, then it brought in multiple installs of various places into various locations. And after they had done that, they again went and took the their specialized binary out. So now all the installs look normal. But on the various target machines, they had installed now. Okay. And now the fact that on all of the target machines, which were basically mostly, yeah, you guessed it, Microsoft Windows machines, there was no compartmentalization. So once they got into one of the hundred or more background programs running under system control, they basically had the whole machine to copy off anything they liked at any time they wanted onto any piece of spare disk space they wanted, and then take their time analyzing it, seeing what they wanted to do, and pick it up. Okay. So that's an example of today's break in where, you know. They just blew it, you know, like five times in a row. Five places where they could have had a compartment that they didn't. So which five places are you referring to? What? Which five? So, so for example, they broke in on the same, having a, a single authentication factor that was easily deducible. The fact that the people who built the systems didn't properly manage their change, what was changed versus the things being changed. Okay, that's a personal compartmentalization. The fact that they didn't compile everything from source that could and should easily be diffed and analyzed by people, but just uh, changed by uh, somebody else who's binary subroutine library they depended on without uh, any proper review. No. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, this, this may be more of a, 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 a concept to an question here in terms of, when you say that it's not compartmentalization, can we, it, it is compartmentalized, it's just that the flow of, when, when we compartmentalize, we need to still share data between compartments. Isn't it essentially setting the rules incorrectly for how data is shared? That is the lack of compartmentalization. Ah. How do you differentiate it? Right. So the question that was asked basically was there are compartments, and we need, do need to share data between compartments. We do need to cross compartments. Was this that we didn't build the compartments correctly? Or what, you know, was it that we didn't put the proper rules on them? 
was this a, a person problem versus a, a, not a process problem, lack of process poor process. Good question. So I would say it was a little of both, but mainly the fact that we that the the compartments you couldn't put the proper rules on some of the compartments because they basically don't have the rules, the ability to put the rules on them. And at the very end, for example, on the Windows system, there's no place you can put the rule. So the rule, the, the rule says, you know, one way to look at the rule is if your system, you can do anything you like. And we know that's a bad rule, but we can't put a right rule on it. There's no compartment civilization that we can put the rules on. There's also the, as you said, the when we're actually building from configuration management where the rule should be, we only build into the new build those items which are associated with approved change notes. Well, we had the wrong rule. So the compartmentalization would have been sufficient to stop at a fat point if we had applied the right rule. So those are, that's a place we could have done better and we could have stopped it. You know, since there are, shall we say, five places we could have stopped. Can I answer your question? Okay. Similar questions either in the classroom or on, on Zoom. All right, let's move on. So I want to talk first about server systems. That is the server systems on which we have our databases on which the data is. And I'm going to say there's nothing really that we can do that will fully solve the problem. We need a set of hardware and an operating system that can do what multics did. It doesn't have to be a multics, but it has to have those kind of characteristics in the hardware and in the operating system to build our base of databases and applications on. And there's nothing that I'm aware of in the commercial environment today that you can buy that can do that. And the cost and time of doing it yourself is prohibited. Okay. Yes, you can do a lot of mitigation, but there's nothing you can do from the system level for our server systems that will solve the problem. Okay. So the, the, the other half of that is the embedded systems, where my example was detector electronics, fire detection and mitigation system, where that network is Actually, we will guarantee that network on a six-mile range, six miles, you know, in a big oil refinery, for example, with a control on the very few, in our case, one, places where it connects to the rest of the world. And the same thing is true of our 
drug infusion systems. We can take our medical systems and do the and set up their connections in such a way that they can be fully protected. I'm not aware of anyone that actually has done it, but I will maintain that the cost and practicality of doing it is here if we would choose to do so, but we have it. So, but again, most of the medical systems we have were built in the era before networks and the networks have been sort of grafted onto them rather than designed in the process of them. Now, I would say detector electronics got lucky. And the reason they got lucky is because they had to build over a big physical location and the existing protocols wouldn't do the job for them. So they had to find one that would be uh, redundant and have long distances and they built one job. So they got lucky and other people got nobody. But you can do that. Okay. Next slide. The Internet of Things and other things, we have, such as our cell phones, where we have many remote small devices and we don't have a lot of control over them. Updating is the issue. Public and private keys to do the updates and having sandboxes and things like that is the, is the key to being able to do it right. I don't have enough personal data to, to, to give opinions as to how secure they are or how unbreakable they are and so forth. But I have already seen things coming where people have, are monitoring uh, items and discovering, oh, the refrigerator door hasn't been opened in two weeks. I'll bet there's nobody in that house. Hey, that's going to be my target for my next break-in. And lots of things. Within the, uh, but I do have a thought. And that is, we can take our applications program and write them in a way that they, it is harder to break in. And here's something I ran across just, just recently. Uh, at F, our graphics cards with many CPUs are now being used for lots of other things. Okay. Uh, there is a, an FGPA based graphics card and there is a public statement by a hackers group that they've been breaking into these cards and they tried to break into one. And there's one that they discovered they couldn't break into at all. So they got the code, they disassembled it, they analyzed it, they tried to break it, they couldn't break it. Why? Well, the code was written in Spark Ada. It had already it had been analyzed, proved, verified that the kinds of things like overruns and out of bounds and all those kinds of things, none of them were there to be used to break in. But they wanted to break in, so they continued to look at it and they found a hardware bug in the RISC V hardware that was underneath it, and they broke into their heart into the hardware. Uh, that's on uh, blog.adacore.com uh, uh, under one of their uh, uh, blogs. Uh, there's a group up in Czech in Czech Czechoslovakia. Sorry, it's just the, the Czech Republic now. Called Muen, M-U-E-N. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Yeah, towards the next one. That's what are we talking about? Yeah, one more. 
Shai was only four. Um, I must have put that in after I did the one time. Okay. We've already had Docker containers mentioned as a OA. Uh, the Muin kernel was written in Ada Spark, so you can have multiple times there. And I want to remind people that uh, for the typical operating system, you don't have a chance. There was already a remark that uh, Google uh, it, it doesn't tell you what's done with their data. But the real problem with something like Google is that there are hundreds of people out there with admin permissions on the Google systems. If you get an insider attack on one of those, they can steal all sorts of stuff. On an operating system like Multics, you didn't worry too much about insider attacks because they couldn't get at anything. You have an insider, but it was still protected. And yes, I said and where I'm working is I'm working, I'm doing my own personal research, although I'm not working uh, industrially anymore, this one on Ada. And I have a complete personal copy of the of the Ada letters. It talks about all the ways in which you do high integrity inside applications in writing code for your integrity. Because after all, if we take a look, when they broke into the operating system, they actually broke into one of the applications that was running on the operating system by many of the well-known ways of taking advantage of poor programs. So if we go to say, hey, I'm gonna make sure I write correct code, then we have it. Yes, Ada is definitely not the solution for everything. It wasn't designed for user interfaces. It wasn't designed for a lot of other things either. But any place where you need to do reasonable correctness, it's there. And let me point out that the latest, one of the latest ones I saw was people saying, I got to go and see because I got to twiddle all the bits of the hardware. Nope. The latest versions of Ada's uh, ability to map data interfaces means all you have to do is write down what the hardware interfaces do and let the compiler do all the bit twiddling and all the bit map and shifting and everything like that. So you don't make any of those kinds of mistakes either. All right. Uh, so that sort of is uh, my conclusion, which says, we need a compartmentalized server. We don't have it. We can build compartmentalized uh, embedded systems. We ought to. And we can build our applications in much better ways so that even if they get into something that isn't compartmentalized, they're unlikely to be able to break in to the application and then so they won't be able to get in today. I'm ready for questions. And of course, questions of all kinds I the past to learn. Either here in the uh, classroom or over here. Something from uh, discussing uh, your uh, talk this time uh, through. Sure. The, the remark that I heard was like, yes, but if only compartment is uh, easy. Like, I mean, if, yeah, people understand things like this. Uh, we need better compartment. Like, we need easy, better compartment. Easy, easy. Okay. easy. But in, in the real world, you have, uh, you're not, as you said, you're not going to eat that up or eat up or anything. Right? I mean, 
there are things that do not require or do not have all the features that you need. So how do you exist in a world? How do you build systems where even if you uh, break into one mode, you, you don't get it out of like what, what principles uh, uh, design to be adopted? Or what are the general thoughts on how you do that? Okay. So the, the, the question is, this is this is all nice, but I live in the real world and what can I do? I mean, it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. Well, my card says software quality assurance across the life cycle. And what we've talked about to a great degree is having good compartments, and that comes from having the right architecture to build on top of. And that comes from having the right requirements, you know, and understanding our requirements. So one answer is we start, we go back and we write the right requirements. Right. And we come back with say, yeah, but we live in the real world and we don't have the opportunity to do the right requirements. Uh, we know that there are things like code reviews, and we see that people don't use, that a lot of organizations don't do code reviews. And so they get lots of things that are preventable. Uh, but what I talked about where they put the password to the system used to build the system into a public place. I mean, those are simple things that we certainly ought to be able to avoid. Yeah, I mean, but those kinds of things are going to happen. That's what I mean. Like you, yeah, you, we cannot build a feeling that there will be under person protection at some level. There is going to be one break in somewhere. Some, somebody puts the bubble in a place like by one it's there. The question is like, you, you shouldn't be able to reach deep into the system just because you had uh, attacks of the sort. Like, how do you design it? So the question, so the comment was that you shouldn't be able to reach deep into the system in order to get to the things that enable you to break in. And I agree with the statement. When we live in a place where once you get in, you can reach deep into the system, what can we do? You know, the, the, You know, the, 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 the simple answer is, you know, program in a programming language that we can verify. You know, no, it doesn't have to be made up. You know, the operating system doesn't have to be made up. Um, in, in the real world, we've gone to two factor of that authentication, and, I, and that is. A, a great um, solution to a part of the problem. <laughs> I don't think I really answered your question. I just wanted to stop. No, yeah. I, I know it's not like that is one particular answer to this going to solve the problem. The other question that I don't know, I, I don't want to monopolize the Well, you made an assertion there, and I'm trying to think of other examples. One that comes to mind is AWS. Yes, is say again. Uh, Amazon, Amazon's cloud hosting service. AWS. AWS. Amazon Web Service. Yeah. Yep. And that's a system where the individual VMs are obviously just there just running you know, Linux and not very, not very interesting. But the but the host system has 
historically been highly successful at keeping those VMs isolated from each other. They just sit there and they do their thing. And even if my web server or my what my business web application is running on the same hardware as my worst competitor, you just can't do anything about it. That's, that's a, that seems to me to be a very well implemented uh, compartmentalization strategy. Okay. So so the comment was made that certain items like Amazon Web Service run in virtual machines, and that gives great compartmentalization. Now, uh, the virtual machines do give good compartmentalization. And as long as you have an application that doesn't have a need for uh, real-time sharing of data. Uh, so you, you don't need to have totally high performance. That is a good and acceptable. No, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's a, great, uh, a great answer. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll give. I'll answer a different question. So, uh, if you try and use uh, uh, Google to find answers to things, you often you can discover that you can ask the same question and get two different answers to it. Okay, because the Google file system by design it is meant to be resilient rather than consistent okay and I, I i discovered this when a company decided to located on a corner decided to change their official address from one address to the other for like about six months both those addresses were up there it wasn't consistent but it didn't have to be and it was okay uh, certainly the, the, the virtual machine solution does not work when like the detector electronics, the items in, in uh, consideration have to be physically distributed from each other. Okay. Uh, but hopefully we don't have a lot of those either. Okay, so I like your, your virtual machine answer for compartmentalization. What I would the what I would like to see at the at the at the at the level of the virtual machine is to somehow be able to like Multics did break it into memory segments and be able to do sharing at a lower level uh, of of uh, some size. Good. Any, uh, any, uh, another one or follow on? One of the things that's popular is the microservices architecture. Do you think that is the way to you know, build applications that are okay? So the question is, what do I think about the microservices architecture, where by we effectively compartmentalize a service? Yeah. Um, they still share things. And they still share things under the covers. You know, and, and if we can uh, properly do sharing under the covers, where the only thing we see is the service. That's good. The question is, can we, uh, the things we have to share and the individual services give us the performance we need? And I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, I, I'm going to answer a different question that nobody's asked. You know, when Multics was built, its kernel had 50,000 lines of code. 
and that was considered to be horrible because it was so way big and they did tremendous amounts of work to show that it was correct or at least as best they could with the technology at that time today if we write things in a provably correct language we can check half a million source lines of code overnight together usually with the generation of a counterexample that shows why it's not right for somebody to go off and fix but I still, you know, and for the person who made the comment earlier, can't we use a Unix machine or a Linux machine? <coughs> uh, you know, uh, their kernels are orders of magnitude larger than the Multics kernel was at that time. And they're written in languages which are not as proven. So again, that leads us to how can we map the technology we have today and the and the architecture and the hardware we have today and what we've learned to do into building more reliable software. And I don't maintain it's an easy question, but I do maintain that there are parts of it that we long ago solved that are applicable that we're not using, that we want to use. Other questions? Uh, I was asked earlier about the slides, and yes, we can make the slides for today's presentation available to those who are here, here in the classroom, those who are in the Software engineering class and those who are in the today. I will put Sanjay as a copy if you can make them a copy. I would make the slides available and hopefully we'll have the my computer record at the proceedings today. I think it will be ready to record. So I post it on our Amtech uh, YouTube channel. Uh, also, it's possible on the event information. So, are there any questions on the remote attendee Zoom session? Let's go to the last slide then. It says, Mike B and all of us that listening to what we hear and then asking what we hear about it, asking questions are the path to learn. And I will say that I learned one additional thing, one of the many additional things that I learned this week. I came across two words. One word was arigato, and the other one was obigado. They sound very much alike. And they both mean the same thing. One's in Japanese, the other one's in Portuguese. They apparently came into existence independently, have no relationship between the two of them, but both of them mean thanks. So thanks for coming and listening today and you have also have my email or card uh, to send me email questions or ask me questions if you see me at a future time. Thank you, Sanjay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, speaker, for um, enlightening discussion and um, presentation on compartmentalization. Um, with that, we will close the proceedings for the day. Thank you. <laughs>